Is the conflict in Syria coming to an end? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Mayan Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Omar Dahi. Omar Dahi is Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dean of Faculty, and Professor of Economics at Hampshire College. He's the founding director of Security in Context, an international research initiative on global affairs. He is also a co-editor of Zadalia and served as a lead expert on the UN Economic and Social Commission of West Asia's National Agenda for the Future of Syria program. Omar Dahi, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you so much, Moin. I've been following uh, the program, actually, and watched many of the episodes. So hopefully I can continue to uh, keep the bar high as I've learned a lot from, from this. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Almar, and I'm sure you'll manage to raise it higher today. Um, let's jump right in with an issue that's been very much in the news recently. Um, Syria's admission, or readmission rather, to the Arab League last month. Um, this completes a series of normalization agreements between Damascus and various Arab governments that had previously promoted regime change in Damascus. Why did they reverse course? Um, what are their current objectives in Syria? And do you expect that these objectives will be achieved? Yeah, and actually, uh, just as I was sitting down to, uh, you know, log on to, to talk with you, there was a joint statement issued uh, by uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and the foreign ministers of the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, after a meeting. And it's actually uh, interesting to have read through that statement, and maybe I'll return to it uh, later on in, in the discussion. Uh, but it lays out a series of uh, kind of joint outlooks on the region and uh, from Iran to Yemen to Syria uh, and, and other issues as well. And it's actually quite striking in um, its tone, which is significantly less, let's say, bellicose towards Iran and, and other regional actors that were adversaries, let's say, to the GCC, uh, and really signals the kind of shift that's happening in the region. Uh, it's hard to, of course, uh, wrap our minds around the entirety of this shift and uh, to speculate about where it might go. Uh, there are lots of possible futures open. Uh, but I think it's good to answer your question in, in the context of where things were uh, over the past uh, years, especially since the start of the conflict. Uh, because you're right, there have been significant shifts in the policies of uh, the Arab governments. Uh, but there's also a lot, uh, as academics like to say, to unpack there. Uh, Go right ahead. By that, I mean... Who are the actors specifically? Which Arab governments in particular are you referring to? What have their policies been, right? And what are the shifts uh, that have been made? And when actually did these shifts begin? Because this is not something that has just didn't happened. didn't start last order. night. Yes, it didn't start last night. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we don't have time to go into a blow-by-blow -blow account of this. So let me try to be as brief as possible and uh, feel free to push me along if I dwell too much on unnecessary details. But I think one way to put this is in the aftermath of the Syrian uprising, uh, which turned into, uh, of course, a devastating war, uh, you could say there was an ecology of regime change. What I like to say is an ecology of regime change, which is broader than just discrete actions for regime change. The ecology of regime change refers to a much broader spectrum of possibilities and a climate that essentially advocates for a change of regime in a particular country. And I think it's safe to say that the United States set this in motion uh, because of the United States power, cultural influence, uh, media influence, uh, and all sorts of levers of power that it has. It has that unique ability that other countries don't have. Uh, for example, in Russia and Ukraine, there was an invasion without the kind of corresponding broader um, uh, issues. And by those issues, I mean verbal uh, kind of uh, discursive kind of pronouncements by the head of state, such as Barack Obama saying that Assad has to go, to uh, 
economic sanctions to diplomatic procedures that isolate the Syrian government and put pressure on it uh, to work within the United Nations and the Security Council uh, to uh, basically funding opposition groups, even NGOs and civil society dissidents and uh, work through think tanks, uh, whether think tanks in the US or think tanks in the region uh, that kind of basically promote the idea that this this thing needs to happen. And this is so, so I, making regime change um, uh, kind of conventional wisdom, if you will. Right. Making regime change conventional wisdom. And that's even before you get to the actual arming and funding of opposition groups that are uh, going to sort of fight the, the battle for, for regime change. Um, I would say that uh, the several Arab governments were participants in this ecology and leading this uh, in their own way. Uh, that included Qatar, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, to a various extent, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and of course, the key non-Arab conduit for this was, was Turkey uh, in terms of uh, those actors. And as many of your viewers would know, there is a close relationship between Qatar and mm -hmm. Turkey on the one hand, uh, who uh, sort of coordinated a lot of their actions, or let's say we're on the same side throughout um, so in this, yeah. let me interrupt you just and, and say I, I noticed that you didn't mention Jordan. Um, are are you taking the position that Jordan served as kind of a rear base and conduit without necessarily itself embracing um, uh, the ecology of regime change? I would say Jordan played a much more cautious role overall. Um, it was not in the leading. Uh, my assessment is that it's not in the leading edge of this. Uh, first, because of the capacity, it doesn't have the capacity to fund and arm and kind of provide the kind of significant resources. It relies on external aid. Second, due to its proximity to the Syrian regime and the fact that there are significant consequences for Jordan, uh, especially as the fighting evolved, uh, and the possibility of actually an entire regime collapse became something that's possible. What would the consequences be for Jordan? Of course, Jordan was already uh, receiving hundreds of thousands and, and perhaps over a million of, of refugees. Um, and so I would not label Jordan as a, a, the kind of vanguard of this process. Mm -hmm. uh, we can sort of provide a more sort of bigger assessment of Jordan's role, but I would say the leading protagonists were right. else. Yeah, the ones um, you've, you've named already. Yeah, and so there are a few things to say about their actions. The first is that, of course, they verbally condemned the Syrian regime, called for uh, you know accountability and removal of Bashar al-Assad, um, and uh, funded the opposition groups as part of the Friends of Syria, sort of so-called kind of structures, uh, provided basis for kind of political opposition to operate, facilitated their kind of diplomatic maneuvers, recognized at some point uh, Syrian opposition members as the sole legitimate members of, of the Syrian government, provided them with a seat instead of Syria and so on. Um, we can talk more about that. Uh, the one quick thing to note is that, of course, uh, there were uh, differences that developed among these groups. So while they were participating in this broader ecology, I would say, um, given the broader things that were happening in the region, and I perhaps should have led by this, uh, by saying that for those countries, there is the serious specific issues, right, and that we can trace, but there's also the regional policy of which Syria is one and not always the main issue. Uh, there's the broader considerations that they have in mind. Given the broader considerations, uh, there was uh, suspicion by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates of the rising influence of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, through Qatar and Turkey of uh, what was happening in Egypt, uh, the, the coming to power of a democratically elected Muslim Brotherhood uh, government, so to speak. This uh, is that, uh, the Mohammed Morsi uh, government between uh, 2012 and 2015 in Egypt. And, and they immediately worked in the region to push back against this, right, and support anti-Muslim Brotherhood forces. And the same thing is true in Syria. Uh, that along the general lack of 
unity of the political and military opposition led to significant fragmentation inside Syria and in terms of the political opposition as different Arab governments were kind of both supporting the general thrust of the, the opposition against the government while also undermining each other in various ways. Um, I would say, so as late as 2015, let's say before the Russian intervention in Syria, um, <clears throat> Or thereabouts. Still, if you look at the kind of public statements and and the general climate, it was still very much in favor of regime change, accountability, no normalization with Assad, no concessions, and so on. Um, that, that's say, that's as far as as the regional parties are concerned. But many have pointed out that um, Washington, which you were referring to earlier, quite quickly developed cold feet and um, shifted to a strategy of seeking to bleed rather than kill um, uh, the Syrian regime. Would, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I would say that um, the, the idea of a full-scale armed intervention to overthrow Assad by the United States was not ever seriously considered and not on the right. table. And I think this is what the Obama administration tried to signal, uh, but also it was giving out multiple signals, right? That's why I said the ecology of, of regime change isn't simply your actions, but it's also signaling to all sorts of actors to engage in, in, in their own initiatives mm -hmm. and send signals to the Syrian opposition, particularly in light of what was happening in Libya that, you know, a series of events might lead to an armed intervention by the U.S. Uh, if there is uh, a, a massacre or chemical weapons are used, if you remember back to the sort of the yes. 2015. The, the, um, the famous fight. red line. The famous red lines. Enough outrages. This is in the minds of perhaps the Syrian opposition and, and their backers. And enough outrage or enough evidence of the atrocities, of which, of course, there is no shortage, uh, might lead to that. And I think that was not in the cards. What... Uh, was in the cards was potentially the U.S. would just completely take a backseat, which was not viable because of the fact that, uh, you know, Syria is already, I mean, in, in the minds of the, the Western sort of policy uh, world, of course, you know, it's easy to set uh, this ecology of regime change because Syria was already an enemy state, subject to sanctions throughout my lifetime. So the idea of simply doing nothing uh, would, is not viable. So the kind of alternative was actually a significant uh, arming and funding of opposition groups to bleed the Syrian government, weaken it, so that someone else would potentially uh, be the one to overthrow it. So the, the U.S. could kind of have it both ways, deny its involvement publicly, even though it's you know, come out in various ways, uh, while not, uh, so to speak, taking full ownership of the situation so that they would not want to repeat of, of what happened in Iraq and, and, and so on. There was no mood for the U.S. to actually kind of be fully on the ground in Syria. Um, so that, that was what's happening with the U.S. And I think the Geneva uh, Accord, the June 12th, the sort of initial Geneva statements between Russia and Syria and their, uh, Russia and the United States kind of signaled that, but also each side took from it what they wanted to take, which is that the, the United States understood it as there would be a political solution and transition that Russia would oversee. And Russia took it to mean there would be a political a solution that the government would oversee, the Assad government, right? So and you're again, speaking about the Russian-American understandings. Russian-American uh, understanding, yes. right. And, and again, this is like incredibly like many things else there's this is not a linear process. This right. is kind of roughing the edges here. Um, but the shift, I would say, with the Arab governments, uh, particularly ones like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and others, uh, uh, happened gradually. First, the Russian intervention put the possibility of regime change out of the question because mm -hmm. you're, you won't have to go up against the Syrian government. You're going up against Russia, a major power. The rise of ISIS and the international coalition against ISIS and the idea that the Syrian military opposition had become essentially hopelessly uh, controlled by groups that, uh, uh, you know, they labeled as Islamist extremists and outside the control of those governments. And again, the rise of ISIS made that kind of 
uh, off the table to kind of continue support uh, in, in a decisive way. Uh, so those shifts alongside the general fact that the regime was reclaiming territory and Russia was backing it completely, uh, this was not predetermined. I mean, the regime was in uh, in trouble in 2013-14. Uh, which, which is why the Russians intervened in its support. Why the Russians intervened, yeah. exactly. exactly. Um, and I would say uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, which had maintained some ties, they had hosted Syrian business families, of course, some opposition, but also not some not opposition group, uh, increasingly revived those ties. Uh, over you know the 2017-18 period leading up to today, so it's been a gradual process. Um, you can perhaps factor other shifts in the policies of Saudi Arabia more broadly. Here we're going to talk about the regional mm -hmm. climate and the international climate in the aftermath of the U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. Lots of other kind of geopolitical shifts where uh, those governments seem to be recalibrating. Uh, their policies. And of course, where that goes from there, I mean, this uh, Iran-Saudi Arabian deal was sponsored by China. Uh, uh, it was perhaps tacit, okay, from the U.S., but shows kind of the re reassessment of those countries, rebalancing their ties, significantly trying to, um, given the fact that the U.S. Uh, role is ambiguous, um, not, not clearly defined at this point from their perspective. Um, they wanted to take the initiative and kind of do regional uh, rapprochement, so to speak. Uh, so that's- So, that's where so these, these um, regional governments that had been invested in regime change in Damascus came up against the realization that they could not achieve that objective. And it was on this basis that the reconciliation began um, ultimately culminating recently in Syria's readmission uh, to the Arab League. Uh, and what would you say are, are the key objectives of these um, uh, reconciliations? Is it this um, belief that it can serve to reduce Iranian influence in Syria? Um, is it in order to promote a political settlement in Syria? What, what are your indications regarding the key objectives that those pursuing normalization with, with the government in Damascus are trying to achieve? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a good question. And one of the things that I guess we can think about is what were they pursuing to begin with? And I just, a coda to that uh, is, I mean, there, there was a sense, of course, in, in the early stages of regime change, but also a chance to weaken uh, a kind of out of control government weaken the Iran uh, Hezbollah Syria nexus, so to speak, right? Iran, you know, Syria was the weak link perhaps in that. Uh, so even if regime change didn't occur, there would be a kind of cutting down the Syrian government that had so often demonized them uh, directly, especially Bashar al Assad mm -hmm. since the 2006 war and elsewhere, Lebanon, demonized yes. them and humiliated them or ridiculed them publicly and so on. So cutting them down to size, weakening the Syrian state um, was also an objective. Whether or not regime change was fully carried out, uh, that there were other objectives that you can perhaps think about. And so you could almost ways, surmise yeah. that it was mission accomplished uh, to a certain extent. It was mission accomplished to a certain extent, but at the same time, uh, it also led to further entrenchment of Iran and also exactly. Russia, right? Yeah. So it's it's mixed. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, yes, the Syrian state is weak. It's no longer has the capacity to project its power uh, in the way that it used to. Uh, it no longer has the capacity. Uh, I mean, if you talk about you know the, the chemical weapons, which Syria kind of had as a strategic deterrent to Israel or as a kind of a, uh, a, a you know, a, a card of, uh, in its arsenal of what it has, has it's been stripped of that. Uh, so that objective was accomplished, the legitimacy of the government itself in the eyes of its half its population or however many of its population and international actors. Nevertheless, there were unexpected outcomes there. So that's why I'm saying why it's complicated. And among the unexpected outcomes is 
Um, in many ways, Hezbollah gained in power uh, in, in some ways, the Iranian uh, kind of entrenchment in Syria, Russian entrenchment. So slowly those governments saw themselves perhaps uh, uh, as the tides were shifting in terms of the, the possibilities of regime change, losing out to these secondary uh, processes of which they had no influence over. And so they became regionally out of the out of the power or out of the influence. Uh, Cut your losses. Exactly. So cutting their losses, one aspect of that. Um, and, you know, normalization is, is maybe a good term because, you know, normal, normal relations doesn't mean you control the Syrian government. Normal relations, you're one of many actors, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, they see Iran as being influential. They see, of course, Russia as being influential, but they see, I mean, if you go back to 2011, there were significant Gulf investments and yeah. so on. So, Given the need for economic reconstruction, which neither Iran nor Russia uh, can supply, uh, per, you know, perhaps that is uh, part of a process of regaining influence. It doesn't mean that they can, you know, sometimes this process is taken to extremes. Can they uh, convince Syrian government to part with Iran? It's not either this or that, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not something that, that is in the cards, given the reliance and given the relationship that, that has developed with Iran. But that need not be the immediate objective for them to feel that they're regaining a foothold in the country. And, and of course, there was this prominent state visit by the Iranian president um, uh, to Damascus uh, shortly after the normalization with Saudi Arabia was announced. Um, uh, but getting back to the uh, bigger picture, uh, as you indicated, Syrian government currently rules over most of the country's population, but key regions remain outside its control. There is the province of Idlib in the country's northwest, governed by the HTS-dominated opposition forces, and the areas governed by the Kurdish-dominated SDF in, in the northeast. And of course, there's also um, still a... Um, U.S. military presence um, uh, in the country. What is the prognosis for these regions, additionally bearing in mind that Turkey is a key factor in both Idlib and with respect to the um, Kurdish-dominated regions? Yeah, here too, this is an example of the complication of the situation on the ground in the country. It's a kaleidoscope. Uh, yeah, and, and we can, I mean, you laid out some of those uh, actors and their areas of influence and, uh, you know, audience can kind of Google areas of influence in Syria and look at these fancy visualization by the Carter Center or the, uh, there's another project on armed conflict uh, that, that kind of looks at this kaleidoscope and various color coded regions and and you can see that in some regions particularly in the northeast there's overlapping areas of control and pockets of government syrian government control with the kurdish uh let's say groups Assad, uh, the the um, syrian democratic forces and so on um i think you know here too we have to talk about the economic and the humanitarian situation when we talk about the prognosis sort of not just sort of the geopolitics and the politics of this but the fact that you know this country and these regions have suffered just immense destruction, uh, the the actions of the Syrian government, uh, the the brutality with which they pursued uh, kind of the war against the opposition, uh, and and the armed conflict as a whole has led to destruction in in in, in various areas that is completely um, uh, you know prevented the kind of normal life. For, for uh, resumption in those areas. So people have to flee and, and you have the crisis of uh, internally displaced people and, and of refugees. Um, so what I would say is, uh, so you're right, you have areas that are uh, under regime control, which is most of the country in sort of most of the central parts of Syria up to the uh, Northwest and some of the coastal regions and in the, the center and north to the northeast, up to the Euphrates River, uh, so to speak, under regime control all the way to the south, to most of the south, let's say. And then in the northeast, you have the Kurdish uh, and the allied forces with about 800 US troops. 
Uh, and then in the remaining parts, you have mostly uh, Turkish controlled areas uh, with the uh, so-called salvation government areas that is under the control of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, mm -hmm. which ultimately, you know, Turkey is um, not necessarily as in control in the day-to-day -day life, but uh, basically uh, the ultimate. It's back. the guarantor. The guarantor, that's right. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and in the areas under Turkish control, I mean, you see uh, a situation that you don't think is going to change in the in the time uh, anytime soon. Uh, Turkish, uh, you know, as as several reports have put it, there's no Turkish institution that exists in Turkey that doesn't also exist in some of those areas. Uh, Turkish universities, just cultural institutions, uh, the Turkish language is being sort of taught uh, in in uh, schools. Um, uh, as a second language, but you know it's being taught in schools alongside Arabic. Uh, Turkish currency is being used, so significant investments that assume a more permanent presence, right? Uh, the integration of those areas economically, socially, and culturally is has been significant. Um, in the case of uh, the areas under Kurdish control uh, and allies, which includes Arab forces as well, not not purely Kurdish, but that's kind of the leading sort of edge of that. Yeah. Um, and US presence, you have, of course, uh, other complications as well. I mean, there is a um, uh, an open air prison called Al Hul Camp uh, of around 50 to 60,000 people who live under just terrible conditions. Um, the overwhelming majority of those are youth. Uh, this was a camp that has absorbed various kinds of refugees over the years, but was used as a place to house ISIS kind of the families of ISIS. And uh, many of them are Syrian, many of them are Iraqi, many of them are kind of international. They're, they belong to European and other countries. Uh, and and there, is, we, there has to be a solution. It's a, it's a dire economic situation, dire security situation. It's, it's kind of a brutal situation overall. And other areas as well um, have immense poverty. The Idlib governorate under the, the Hayat Tahrir al-Sham uh, have uh, of course, suffered and, and they've suffered from the earthquake, which we can kind of return to as yeah. well. We'll, but we'll even before the war, well. even before the war, the east of Syria and the northwest, many of those territories were among the most impoverished. The Idlib region was already among the most impoverished in terms of unequal access to health care and education and investments. The, the eastern parts of Syria, including some parts that have immense amount of oil wealth. So there are these disparities that were significantly compounded by the war. Uh, and as a result, the situation in those areas are, are quite complicated. Now, you can't imagine the status quo changing anytime soon unless there's a series of gradual steps. And we've heard, for example, in the last few days <clears throat> of increasing uh, Syrian, uh, Iranian, uh, Russian potentially, uh, harassments or attacks on American troops trying to mm -hmm. kind of force a new status quo, trying, trying to make life increase. This is in the Northeast. In the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, we can talk more about this if you're interested, but I mean, I think that one of the things that's been discussed over the past several years is some sort of political settlement between the Kurdish controlled areas and the Syrian government. And I think if there was a US government that had tried to sponsor that, let's say, and push for a settlement along acceptable lines, that may have happened. But part of what has happened over the past 12 years are, I would say, missed chances. Every time a particular side gains the upper hand, uh, it doesn't see it as a chance to extract concessions and settle with the weaker side, but rather sees it as a chance for a vote victory. Right. And and I think this has alternated between the different sides. Now the Syrian government thinks it has the upper hand. The more it has the upper hand, the more it thinks, why should it settle for lesser demands and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of dynamics that exist. Uh, these are dynamics between um, the government in Damascus and and the Kurdish YPG, essentially. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I think at this point, the the um, the question of of a settlement uh, would have to deal with the US opposition itself. Is the US willing to do that and withdraw from the country? Uh, but also under what terms would the political settlement happen? 
if there is an agreement between Syria and Turkey, it would then undercut that because it would be again fully at the expense of the, those Kurdish movements. So it's it's there's a actually a situation where you know the the future is not clear. It depends on on where the alliances shift and what the role of the main actors will be there. Because this is much bigger than as as you're indicating, it's much bigger than just the relationship between. The Syrian government and uh, the Kurdish movement, because um, Turkey could easily play the spoiler in any such arrangement. Um, the U.S. is keen to prevent any further legitimization of the Syrian government. Um, but at least you're talking about potential political settlements in the Northeast. In the Northwest, I suspect the situation is very different because it's my understanding that a political settlement has really never been on the agenda of either Damascus or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. It's never been on the agenda. And in fact, that region has been almost used as a place to uh, push people from various areas of the country mm -hmm. who felt too afraid to stay in areas that have been recaptured by the Syrian government. As, as a result of these so-called reconciliation agreements. And right. Other... So as the Syrian government was retaking territory, uh, there were essentially surrender agreements that were called reconciliation agreements. Uh, in some cases, the conditions were somewhat favorable to some of the art groups. In other cases, they were not. There was a range of experiences, none of which basically, you could say, resulted in good governance or respect for, for the basic rights of the population as elsewhere. But nevertheless, um, one of the things that happened as a result of those, and, and we can talk more about them in, in more detail, that was just kind of, a, uh, I guess, a quick snapshot of those. But um, they, a lot of uh, groups uh, in the aftermath of those reconciliation agreements who were basically scared for their life, uh, scared for their families of remaining in those areas, were channeled to that region. So they, you know, on top of the already existing difficult state, they were welcoming internally displaced populations. Because parts of these agreements was, was that such people would be given safe passage to Idlib. Correct. Correct. They were given safe passages. There was these infamous green buses that yeah. maybe people have seen in the media transporting them to that region. Uh, and essentially, uh, so it was cast in, in from both those opposition groups who controlled that area. Uh, this is not to say, of course, that the people who, who went there are supporters of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and I think this is something we should try to avoid, thinking that a population that lives under a de facto power are also de facto supporters of that power. Right. I mean, I, that's among the biggest mistakes that I think we should avoid, whether it's in government-controlled areas or other controlled areas as well. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, those populations also have significant fears of the Syrian government, aside from the fact that they may or may not support and probably, uh, given what we know, do not support the policies of Hayat Tahrir sham but it's the entrenched power. So how do you reconcile those things? That's the other factor here. So it's not just about the political powers. Those political powers rule over hundreds of thousands and millions of people. I mean, there are estimates that Turkey, I mean, you know, maybe up to 9 million Syrians are under Turkish control directly or indirectly, whether inside Turkey, or inside Syria, for example. That's that's a significant population. It's not just a small region with a few hundred thousand people. That's almost a third of uh, the Syrian population, no? Right, right. right. Um, but more broadly, the Syrian government appears to have shifted its focus from regaining control of these territories that we've just been discussing to the challenges of reconstruction. Um, with this in mind, could you give an indication of the scale of human and material destruction since 2011 so we have a better understanding of the challenges of reconstruction? Yeah, this is, uh, there are various ways of coming at this. Uh, it's a tricky question as all your questions, not because of the question. I mean, the question is straightforward, but you know, how do, do we make sense and wrap our minds around this? Um, I guess one thing to say about this is part of the reason for them shifting their, their attention to this um, is because of the lack of capacity to actually service those areas if they were to come under their, their control, given the 
the joint impact of the public debt accumulated uh, over the years, the effect of the economic sanctions, and the draining of the resources of the Syrian state to pursue the armed conflict. And some of those are also policies where, uh, you know, that, that really saw the shifting of resources by the government away from investment in development and, and human development broadly to pursue the military conflict. Um, I would say they're, they're sort of a big scope of thinking about the scale of destruction. I mean, e economists and people involved with this process uh, generally pitch this in two ways. One way is to estimate the scale of losses as what are uh, what is the reality in terms of growth of the Syrian economy compared to what it would have been in the absence of the war? So there's that the counterfactual scenario. If there was no war in Syria, what would it be today? What would it be today? And this is where you hear the numbers that go to the hundreds of billions of dollars because they're kind of estimating if the Syrian economy had grown at 4%, let's say. Um, and uh, where would it be today in terms of years of education, in terms of investments in capital and so on, compared to the, its actual trajectory? That's one way of looking at it. And another way of looking at it is simply to look at the costs of the destruction, the physical capital destruction, the infrastructure destruction, the, the economic losses. And so there's ranges of estimates, all of which are from uh, maybe 100 billion to several hundred billion. And sometimes the numbers are politicized. Sometimes the numbers are um, kind of misunderstood because they they deal in different scenarios, right? It, a lot of these, a lot of this work has to do with assumptions that you make, uh, but it's massive. And, um, and even at the say, low end, it's it's yeah. way beyond any um, uh, any figure that could realistically uh, be achieved through trade or investment or aid and assistance or any other um, mechanism. Exactly. And so so at the very least, even the conservative estimates are, are uh, basically show what you can call is a massive financing gap that the Syrian government certainly does not have the ability to bridge, but also neither do its main allies have the ability to bridge. And no other actor seems willing to do so. Even the, the Arab governments, I mean, this would take a significant amount of investment. Now, does this lay the groundwork for other actors like China, for example, to, to come in because there is now uh, a regional political consensus. China has been, for example, uh, wary of being involved in Syria directly in the same capacity that it has in other countries because it would have to take sides essentially in, mm -hmm. in ways that might disturb its other allies like Saudi Arabia and-, and With whom it has much more important relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I'm using allies loosely, but other countries with which it has major interests that it doesn't want to jeopardize. But this kind of, and again, this is why speculating about the future, we'll have to wait and see, but this kind of regional coverage would allow an actor like China to come and invest. And, and course, basically, you're, you're putting that in the context of the recent um, uh, Saudi Iranian and Saudi Syrian normalization. Correct. That would correct. make it more palatable for China to play an expanded role in Syria. Correct. But going back to the um, to the devastation, so you have the sheer destruction, which is uneven. Mm. It depends on the areas. Uh, some areas witnessed much more severe armed conflict, like in the outskirts of Damascus and in Homs and Aleppo, other areas less so. Um, and, and you have uh, that kind of destruction. The other kind of impact of the conflict, of course, is um, the the institutions uh, damage, let's say, the damage to the Syrian institutions, both in the sense of actual public organizations like uh, that, you know, conduct policy, but also to um, kind of, uh, you know, normal um, economic institutions, political, social that have been kind of transformed because, mm -hmm. you know, the de facto powers have pursued kind of political victory, uh, armed conflict to defeat their enemies, which has resulted in um, basically everything being instrumentalized for the war effort. And, and uh, that, brings me to, that brings me to my next question, um, also on the subject of reconstruction. Is, is the Syrian state today a coherent force? Or has it in the course of this conflict been 
degraded and fragmented um, to the point where its institutions can no longer effectively operate, except perhaps um, for the benefit of their own narrow interests. There's a range of perspectives, I would say, on this. Uh, and it's um, clear that the conflict has degraded state capacity. It's clear that the combination of empowering um, basically cronies, empowering um, kind of uh, like people who have emerged to kind of lead the war effort itself Mm -hmm. uh, within the within kind of the 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 framework of the Syrian government's uh, kind of war against the opposition, would you call uh, these state-sponsored warlords or state-sponsored warlords, mm -hmm. uh, war profiteers, middle middlemen, so to speak, who kind of um, benefited from trading between the different areas, people who were there to get around economic sanctions? Uh, you've had. Uh, further blurring between the kind of the public sector, so to speak, and the private sector. And some of that is has already existed in Syria and exists elsewhere, uh, but has been, you know, uh, increased as a result of the sanctions. So when, you know, public officials in their official capacity fall under sanctions, then you might have other people who do not have an official capacity who kind of carry out the functions of the state, uh, but you know, enable kind of the Syrian state to carry its functions, but at the same time, enrich themselves and become entrenched as, as kind of power brokers. So you've seen these the rise of warlords, you've seen the rise of war profiteers. Uh, there are some assessments and there's some people who kind of basically say, yes, uh, the Syrian state is no longer a coherent state. It's mm -hmm. kind of a network of uh, warlords and a network of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, Interest. let's say, yeah, conflict yeah. entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and other people who who kind of have, de you know, the decentralized and autonomous modes of action. I would so say that- vested I, interest. <laughs> no, vested interest. I would say that exaggerates. I, I think mm -hmm. that's at the other extreme. I think we've seen still uh, uh, more, a much more semblance of centralized uh, control uh, including the ability to discipline some key figures in, in the government, mm -hmm. uh, such as the cousin of the president, right? Yeah. Who is considered to be indispensable and kind of at the outset. Uh, Ramzi Mahloub. Rami Mahloub. Rami Rami Mahloub. Mahloub. Sorry. Yeah. And so there was not one individual, even the cousin of the president, who has not, uh, you know, who the regime once it sees uh, as having perhaps too autonomous a role or too independent of a project not necessarily for the betterment of the Syrian people, but for their own kind of power, uh, been able to discipline them. Uh, and I think that, you know, you, you haven't seen minister, you know, uh, ministries collapse. You haven't seen the complete collapse of these public institutions. They've been degraded. The regime has reconfigured their networks of power. They've uh, had to, you know, allow a much wider margin of maneuver for those, uh, for those people who are carrying out their Kind of uh, the regime policy, uh, but I would say it, it's really uh, goes too far to say it's sim it's simply a network of kind yeah. of warlords. Yeah. yeah. Um, but getting back to the issue of sanctions, which which you briefly mentioned, what role do Western sanctions play um, with respect to the challenge of reconstruction? And can these measures be compensated for by Arab, Iranian, Russian, or Chinese initiatives? Yeah, and I think um, the short answer is uh, it depends. Uh, unlikely in the short run, uh, I would say. Um, and it depends a lot on the U.S. government's willingness to enforce these sanctions as a tool of keeping the regime in isolation. Which appears uh, to be the case. Which appears to be the case. And there's also, perhaps even if the White House might be interested in that, Congress is kind of tightening the screws in various ways. Uh, so there's maybe uh, ways in which, and this is the issue with sanctions, is that you kind of, it, it boxes you in uh, because reversing them is much, much harder than installing them, right? Mm. 
Uh, and it basically, it seems like you're rewarding uh, the Syrian government for nothing, essentially. Mm -hmm. So why would they do it? Um, I mean, the, the role they've played, I would say, has been significant. Uh, the, uh, it's hard to disentangle. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in, in the case of Syria, it's hard to disentangle it because you've had devastating armed conflict. Uh, but if you think about it just from a perspective of financing for the Syrian government, you'll see that in the early months, you've had significant sanctions imposed by the US, but more importantly by the European Union. And those sanctions um, immediately went from zero to 100%. Uh, in other words, there wasn't a gradual implementation. They essentially cut off all trade with the We're talking 2011, 2012 now. Correct, correct. Right. Uh, and it was understood at that time that that would be painful. And in fact, uh, you know, this is work that I'm doing right now for uh, a paper on the impact of the sanctions and specifically their impact on institutions. So there's a lot to say there. But in a, in a, in a kind of a brief sense, one impact has been the kind of um, uh, direct impact of minimizing and cutting off the sources of financing for the Syrian government, which has had an impact because they still need uh, even while they were diverting resources to pursue the armed conflict, they still need to be able to provide basic goods and services. And that has starved them from that. So that has accelerated the shift that might have uh, been happening anyway, but accelerated the idea that, uh, you know, with, in the case of scarce resources and you're prioritizing regime survival, you're likely to kind of divert the resources towards the military effort and entrench the military kind of warlordism kind of as beneficiaries of that. The secondary impact is, is the kind of institutional impact that I alluded to earlier of the rise of all sorts of institutions to bypass those sanctions. And one of the things that I did kind of didn't talk about, but the division of the country has had a devastating impact on internal trade of which as, as many countries, you know, not every region of the country is similarly endowed with agricultural and other resources. So you had various areas that served as bread baskets of the country, in addition to being the place where the oil reserves, you know, uh, being the places where then food and, and kind of agricultural product is transported to other regions. That division has actually uh, had a really a terrible effect. And so the the division of the country continues to have a very negative effect and is among the biggest um, kind of leading sources of economic decline, among the biggest, not the biggest. But, but the, the sanctions have also played a role in, in kind of squeezing those institutions and creating this class of, of beneficiaries and middlemen. I would say now, uh, and under the Trump administration, they were expanded to kind of secondary sanctions of going after groups that were, this is the Caesar Act, the so-called yes. Caesar Act, of going after uh, uh, other uh, countries that would invest in Syria and making them liable to be uh, kind of uh, punished. Um, there have been over the past few years and particularly in the aftermath of the earthquake, uh, an attempt to relax some of the most severe aspects of those sanctions to allow for more humanitarian aid and to allow for more civil society organizations, some of which are opposition groups who have also had their work disrupted as a result of the sanctions. Um, but it's unlikely that it's going to be uh, completely removed in any time soon. But it sounds like these sanctions have done a significantly better job at weakening the people of Syria than they have at weakening the Syrian government and regime. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, I think uh, they have, um, and and this is part of an increasing body of evidence uh, on sanctions uh, that uh, they basically often don't fulfill their declared goals in terms of punishment or accountability or regime change or whatever where the declared goals from a desirable perspective are. Um, they've punish the people of Syria. Um, this is the case elsewhere as well. Uh, and I think they've actually, um, um, as part of a process that removed agency from the Syrian people. I mean, the Syrian uprising, this is to go back to the start. The Syrian uprising didn't start because of poverty. 
Mm -hmm. it, it didn't start because of dire poverty in the country. And, and that it, it started actually at a time when the Syrian government was opening its relations with other countries, not being isolated. It started at a place where there's more investments in the country rather than less. So if we think about even the theory of change that is quite cruel to say that if you starve the whole population, they'll rise up against the country, which is morally bankrupt. But even that theory of change it is failed. actually contrary to the evidence. It's actually when you're, you're robbing people of their agency, uh, you're destroying uh, uh, basically the basic provisions of, of livelihood. Uh, and you're not doing anything to actually affect your main stated political objective. And, and in the process, making them, I presume, uh, more dependent on whoever happens to be governing the territory they live in, whether it's um, government-controlled areas, um, Idlib, or, or wherever. Correct. And, and I would say that there's, I mean, again, this is um, a really interesting kind of topic to pursue further, whether on Syria or other countries, especially as economic sanctions are being used more and more. There's a recent report by the Center for Economic and Policy Research uh, that basically uh, claims that 30% of the global economy is now under US, some form of US or Western sanctions. Uh, so, th I mean, th this tool is actually being more and more widely used, and it's a factor in global Kind of global economy it's no longer an incidental or kind of yeah. and, and as we've seen in iraq um it, it would be entirely accurate also to characterize it as a weapon of mass destruction weapon of mass destruction a form of economic warfare um but one that is leading to all sorts of uh, perhaps also unintended consequences yes. such as accelerating ties between countries to go around those sanctions and so it's kind of something that that needs to be looked at, uh, but I think in the case of Syria, undoubtedly it has a, a negative effect. Now, there is it is true that you know there's the, the pushback against this is that always that the Syrian government exaggerates the impact, and I think one of the things we've seen in the aftermath of the earthquake that there were calls for removing the sanctions by the Syrian government, and a lot of the critiques there were that the Syrian government essentially spent more time decrying the sanctions than actually mobilizing whatever was in its capacity to assist those regions. And I think that's a legitimate criticism. I think we need to have an assessment that's away from a kind of a claim, advocacy claim that either whitewash the role of the sanctions or blame them fully, but there is no doubt they've had a devastating impact. And there's no doubt that you cannot actually tell the story without the kind of the devastation that is wrought by the sanctions alongside the armed conflict. But turning now um, to this uh, earthquake, I mean, as you've mentioned earlier this year, uh, Syria was struck by a devastating earthquake that claimed thousands of lives and caused massive destruction. Um, to what extent has this affected the political and economic dynamics um, uh, we've been discussing? I mean, you mentioned briefly that they've led to um, uh, the temporary suspension of some of the sanctions, but in the broader context, how have they, they affected these dynamics um, uh, that we've been reviewing? Well, I would say you can single out or identify a few factors here. I think uh, one outcome has been the acceleration of the uh, normalization efforts, if we can call them that, since we've been calling, that's the term we've been using, with between the various Arab governments, particularly Emirates and Saudi Arabia, the fact that this was such a devastating humanitarian uh, um, kind of crisis, uh, despite the fact that, um, you know, we know that it's not a purely natural disaster. In the case of mm -hmm. the Turkish side, there's lots of sort of the political economy of that and, and kind of the history of that is more complicated. But nevertheless, uh, it was a moment where you know, taking the opportunity of this catastrophe to kind of encourage more uh, integration, more closer ties with the government, and also sending humanitarian aid. Uh, so that was a catalyst for that. So that is that is one of the and and getting back to the earlier part of our discussion, um, would it be accurate to say that these um, Arab governments that that were pursuing normalization? Um, saw an opportunity of sorts in providing humanitarian assistance after the earthquake to demonstrate their 
potential value um, to Damascus and thereby increase their influence in it? I think that's fair to say. I mean, it accelerated definitely a process that was already underway, but it was a perfect chance to show that what they what they could offer that other others can, so to speak. Right. Right. Um, and also the fact that um, uh, you know this is a chance to mend ties or change the ties with Turkey as well, of which mm -hmm. uh, especially Saudi Arabia and and the Arab Emirates were in were in kind of odds as well. What it didn't do is change the dynamics among Syrians. I mean, I think this is was a lost opportunity, and I think it demonstrates the fact that there was not uh, a serious effort at a political settlement. The fact that all the de facto powers had essentially uh, agreed to freeze the conflict, so uh, settle the status quo rather than a, a serious effort uh, at a political settlement that would reintegrate, you know, the political opposition in in a, in a serious way, uh, and again, it had to be a long process. But the fact that there was no um, mechanism from which you could actually take advantage of the the the, the devastation, as as you know, weird as it sounds, it was an opportunity to formulate opportunity, an initiative. To formulate, and and I think one of the things that you saw is that from at the grassroots level, from the Syrian society level, there was an opening. There was a fact that the recognition that this kind of earthquake did not respect political, ideological, sectarian boundaries. It was a shared catastrophe. There was kind of a, uh, let's say, a spontaneous sense that this is a tragedy that affects all Syrians, rather some Syrians at the expense of others. So again, if there was a serious push for a uh, uh, if there was an ongoing political settlement process, and I want to call it peace process for, for all the negative associations. Please avoid that term. It's a yes. political settlement <laughs> process, right? Uh, that that could have been seized as, as an opportunity to do that. Except in, in, instead, it was instrumentalized by the different actors to, to kind of push through their own agenda. Right? Yeah, Whether and seek to strengthen their respective positions. And strengthen their respective positions. And I think, and you know, one of the stories that came out is the failure of the United Nations, right, uh, to respond. And this became a big deal. And, and people probably have heard about this. And the United Nations itself came out and then basically said, we failed in this process. But that failure is in no small part due to the fact that already there wasn't a political settlement because there was a paralysis on who are the right de facto powers to communicate with and, and who has legitimacy and would that kind of immediate intervention have uh, uh, essentially been blessed by the various actors or might have been triggered serious opposition. Mm -hmm. the, the ambiguity there, despite the fact that there is a frozen conflict, the lack of a political settlement that would give some semblance of legitimacy to certain powers that you would know where the boundaries are much more clearly and be able to work and mobilize, I think mm -hmm. itself led to this lack of immediate response. Uh, not to absolve the United Nations from that, but I think, you know, the, the absence of a political settlement continues to yeah. be a problem in, in various ways. And and finally, um, as, as you well know, uh, millions of Syrians have, during the past decade, uh, been forced to flee their homes, and in many cases, the country as well, in search of safety and security. Um, what are the main challenges facing them today? And are there circumstances in which it would be reasonable to expect that they would uh, return to Syria and participate in the reconstruction of their country? There are a number of challenges uh, that start with their own willingness and feeling of safety uh, mm -hmm. if they were to go back. Uh, or whether they would, um, you know, there, there would be a settling of scores with them, or there would be kind of arrests and so on. So there's that. Which seems to have been the pattern thus far. Which has happened, yes, it has happened uh, uh, already, uh, and uh, so there are legitimate reasons to to have that fear. It doesn't mean it's happened with every single person who has returned, but in the absence of a sense of uh, rule of law. Uh, you know, why, why make that risk, right? <clears throat> right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are uh, 
people whose conditions are so destitute in their country where they're residing, whether it's in Lebanon, and in some cases in Jordan, some cases in Turkey, that if they felt that the situation was at least minimally safe, uh, they might be willing to return. Um, so unlike the, the claims that actually the economic situation is, is keeping them in, in these host countries, this is the kind of anti-refugee propaganda that they're receiving so many, uh, so is. much aid mm -hmm. that they would rather stay, right? It's, it's kind of um, uh, perverse in a way. And in fact, uh, many of people who have returned is, is because they're so destitute that they'd rather actually return and risk it in Syria where things may have been cheaper and so on. Of mm -hmm. course, the, the recent inflation and all of that has, has changed some of this calculation. There's that, there's also the fact that where they would return to, many of them have come from areas that are still devastated and are not, do not have a massive reconstruction or ma massive uh, chances for them to have a livelihood. There's the question of their property. Will they still have it, access to their property? Uh, the question of their, um, the civil record, so to speak, the, the mm -hmm. marriages, deaths, uh, the births, and so on. So there's a range of, from kind of big picture issues to sort of small practical issues uh, that are, are kind of obstacles, again, in the absence of some sort of guarantee, some sort of uh, political settlement and, and, and kind of that, that is accompanied by significant reconstruction, but also a sense that you're not gonna be simply at the mercy Right. Of the Syrian state and its and its different institutions, uh, that's a big that's a tough uh, uh, kind of risk to to take. Uh, now again, that does not mean that you will not see kind of people being pushed out, unfortunately. And and one of the things that keep being floated is that Turkey, Qatar will kind of invest in housing to kind of push people out of Turkey into northern Syria and so on. Uh, I would say the further they are from Syria, the less likely they are to uh, yeah. want to return, especially those who have set up in Europe and elsewhere as well. Uh, Omar Dahi, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and insights with Connections. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, Moeen. Great to be here. Thank you.